responsabilité telle tel que définie dans la loi canadienne sur la santé. Tonight, in part four of our five-part series on the Canada Health Act, we delve into accessibility with two stars in the firmament of health policy, Dr. Jane Philpott and Dr. PhD, Dr. Colleen Flood, both of Queen's University, both experts with prodigious CVs and lists of publications, far too long to enumerate here. This webinar will be in English, though we can take questions in French, et je serai très heureuse d'en faire la traduction. Alors, sentez-vous à l'aise pour nous adresser en français. My name is Anne Lagasse-Dowson. I'm the communications person at the Canadian Health Coalition, which is a cross-section of experts, healthcare workers, unions, civil society and nonprofit groups, and individuals. It was founded in 1979 to protect and advance public single-payer universal health care. I want at this point to salute our outgoing chair, Pauline Worsfold, RN, and salute our incoming chair, Jacob McLean of Nupchi. Uh, I'm speaking to you from the unceded territory of the Ganyenkahaka or Mohawk people of the Haudenosaunee Federation, Six Nations Federation in Montreal. And I just want to introduce you very to you very quickly, though they need little or no introduction. Jane Philpott, family physician, former member of parliament, minister of health, indigenous services, and president of the treasury board, who also spent nine years in Niger, West Africa. Um, she is now the director of the faculty of medicine at Queen's and she has a new book, new book, new book. Here it is. You must all buy this book. There will be a quiz at a later time. And, <clears throat> And Colleen Flood, who is the Dean of the Law Faculty at Queen's and founder of the Center for Health, Law, Policy and Ethics, the largest multidisciplinary center of its kind in the world. She is also a leading and exemplary person in the fields of public law. And um, we're so glad to have both of you with us tonight. And I understand not only are you colleagues at Queen's, but you're also friends. Luckily. Very lovely for us too. Um, so it's a real privilege to have these two leading lights with us this evening. And I'm going to start by asking, you know, the very obvious question after reading from the Act. So accessibility in the Canada Health Act is defined as the principle um, that stipulates that Canadians should have, in quotes, reasonable access to insured hospital and doctor services, which sounds very simple on the face of it, but obviously is not in terms of imp implementation. So I'm going to start with you, Jane. What is that intended to mean? What is it supposed to mean and what does it actually mean on the ground? Well, let me start by congratulating you and Canadian Health Coalition for having this series because I believe you are the only organization in the country that is celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Canada Health Act. This is a really, really important celebration. Um, I'm I'm really proud about the fact that my, my book's publication date was actually on the very day of 40 years since the uh, the act passed in parliament with unanimous consent uh, to pass the Canada Health Act. Uh, so it's a really important time. And I think to answer your question, um, you have to think back to what was happening at the time and what access meant then. And it's probably a little different than what access means now, although perhaps we shouldn't uh, assume them to be different. But, you know, the early 1980s, I was in medical school at the time, and I remember what was happening and the barriers of access to care that were related to an enormous uh, burgeoning of user fees and extra billing that was taking place across the country. And things were on the verge of becoming out of control where access was uh, being denied to people who, um, be, based on the fact that if they didn't pay up, they, they might not be able to get access to care. That issue still exists for sure. But on top of that, we've got a whole bunch of other reasons now why access to care is problematic. And, and some of that relates to the fact that we have not designed systems that ensure access to care uh, because you know, I think both Colleen and I to various, in various ways will argue that the, um, the promise of the Canada Health Act has not been entirely fulfilled and that the founders of Medicare always intended uh, Medicare to look like more than it is now, more than just doctor care, more than just hospital-based care. And our access, I think, is largely, um, access issues are, are made worse by the fact that 
we haven't modernized uh, the, the legislation and we haven't modernized our health system uh, to recognize that people need to be able to have publicly funded care by more than just doctors and in places that are more than just hospitals. Mm. Pauline, did you want to add anything to the way that the criteria was intended and what is yeah, happening? No. Jane opened Thanks, a there. Well, I, I, you know, of course, I agree with everything Jane just said. For sure. <laughs> uh, of course. So, as a as a wise colleague at Queens, <laughs> and uh, but it was interesting how you posed the or framed it, and you said, you know, Canadians have the Canada Health Act is simple. Canadians have reasonable access to healthcare, and I usually start my class on. Uh, healthcare systems and law by asking my students, do you have a right to healthcare uh, under the Canada Health Act? And I, you know, normally like 50, 60, 70% will say some version of yes, yeah. and they are probably wrong, right? Uh, because the Canada Health Act doesn't actually say Canadians should have reasonable access. It says that the provincial health insurance plan should ensure reasonable access to uh, hospital and physician services right. uh, without and emphasizes without cost as a barrier. Um, so, you know, the part of the problem is, as Jane says, there's two problems, just, you know, it's more than semantics, this wording, because the first, uh, that the emphasis is on the provincial plan emphasizes the fact that the Canada Health Act is a deal between the federal and provincial governments. It's a spending statute. We'll give you money if you do X. It's not a statement of rights for Canadians, and maybe it should be, but it isn't. Um, and then in terms of the reasonable access, as Jane said, the focus back in 84 with the wonderful Monique Bejean was really on the extra billing and user charges that were happening. And so the assumption was, look, if we just get those out of the way, everything will unfold, rainbows and ponies, it will be beautiful, right? So no real specification or articulation of what reasonable access should actually mean. Now, I think we all know in our minds what it means and it's certainly not what we're getting now so I think we can all agree on that but the trouble with the act itself is that the focus has been for these 40 wonderful years on preventing financial barriers to hospital and physician services and I say I would say it's done up until very recently a pretty damn fine job on that hmm. but the other parts of it right access the substance of the delivery of care is not articulated um, and not insisted upon by the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the provincial government. So, so that's uh, unfortunately the limitations of the act. Um, I'm just gonna mention to those who've joined us that you are more than welcome to hop into the Q&A and pose questions to our two exemplary panelists this is your chance to uh, ask questions directly and i will i will then pass them on and maybe bundle them together in little packets so it'll be more efficient but please do use the q a at mm. your uh, at your leisure and we're going to be putting this uh, webinar up on youtube as well as the other three uh, webinars that we've already done on the canada health act and we're ending our series next week with greg marshall though on on uh uh, public administration of the of the Canadian healthcare system under the Canada Health Act. And then we're having a research symposium on June 20th at the University of Ottawa Law School, which Colleen knows well, um, to really just, you know, roll out the history of the act and the current situation, which as Colleen just alluded to is uh, challenging on many levels uh, 40 years in. Monique Beget came from a refugee family and for her accessibility was a key element mm -hmm. of Canadian health care because her family really suffered when they arrived in Canada in the 19 late 40s or and, in, and right through the early 50s when she was growing up in NDG not far from where I'm sitting right now mm -hmm. um, so I'm interested why did the students think it was a right why did they think accessibility where did they get this idea this is an interesting phenomenon that people think that it's a right and yet 
I yeah, think. well, I think is that the Canada Health Act and the kind of normative, you know, the values of public Medicare transcend the act. So, you know, I think we've had various governments that may have wanted to undo it, move away from it. But I think they're all kind of nervous about doing that, at least explicitly, because Canadians do think that the Canada Health Act gives them something, uh, you know, gives them rights to public Medicare. And they, that's why I think even, you know, law students are a bit surprised to find out that, in fact, there are no rights officially to public Medicare, and at least pursuant to the Canada Health Act. And I think, you know, what we see, you know, as, as both of you know really well, is that the Canada Health Act has had an incredible force in terms of what the provinces have done in response to the requirements of the Canada Health Act. So every province has put in place a melange of laws that try to um, at least meet the, the explicit requirements of the Canada Health Act that says no extra billing and no user charges. So, you know, no sticking extra price tag on hospital and physician services. Um, but in addition, have done more, right? Have done more to try to live up to the principles of, of the Public Health Care Act. So, um, sorry, of the Canada Health Act. So saying, you know, articulating in provincial legislation that, for example, in BC, that the, the goal is access to healthcare on the basis of need and not ability to pay, or um, restricting if doctors are opting out of public Medicare, restricting what prices they can charge if they choose to opt out. So none of those things are specifically listed in the Canada Health Act, but a number of provinces have done that. So so I'd say the Canada Health Act has done yeoman service on the getting the financial barriers out of the way for hospital and physician services. But the trouble is that where there isn't just the supply, and this is Jane's area of expertise, for example, on primary health care, like we just don't have the doctors there delivering primary health care, it's not really going to, not helping you that there's no charge, right? They're just not there. So so that's a beautiful transition to a, a question I think is probably in the minds of attendees and certainly on, on my mind. Like I've seen numbers quoted as high as 6.5 million Canadians don't have access to primary care. Now, I'm not sure how solid that number is because I've seen others 4.5, 4 million. Anyway, it's far too many people who are ending up in the ER hoping to see somebody because they don't know how to access the healthcare system. So I wonder... I mean, you've written a, you've written a book called Healthcare for All, Dr. Phil Pot. So I wonder if you can jump in on that that question of primary care. Absolutely. So um, first of all, those numbers are pretty solid, and they're probably an underestimate. So that six point five million who don't have a family doctor or any other primary care provider comes from the Our Care study that was done by my colleague, Dr. Tara Kieran at U of T and many other collaborators across the country. And they conducted a fabulous uh, series of both um, uh, community engagement sessions, citizen engagement sessions, as well as a survey and basically talked to about 10,000 people and spent about 10,000 hours uh, in conversations with Canadians about what they expected out of primary care. And they, when their report came out over a year ago now, they estimated 6.5 million Canadian adults don't have uh, access to uh, primary care. Um, since that time, the population of Canada has grown by about a million at least. So, you know, I I, I suspect the number is seven and a half million or more that uh, of Canadians that don't have access to care. We're, we've also got really good data here in Ontario looking at the rapid rise of those who don't have access to primary care. Uh, and it's coming from the fact that not only do we have population growth and, and essentially flatlined um, healthcare growth. We're actually losing health professionals uh, who to retirement and to uh, choosing other areas of practice other than primary care. So it, the situation really is dire. And as Colleen said, 
the legislation that we have does not establish a right to health, nor even a right to primary care, as some countries have. It's essentially a guarantee of health insurance for doctor care and hospital care. But we never actually built a system in this country for primary care to establish the right of uh, to access primary care uh, in the country. And uh, because of the way that our, our ad hoc arrangements have been organized, um, there simply aren't enough um, access points to go around. There are, we'll get to the solutions on this later, I'm sure, but um, it, uh, this was not envisioned uh, by the, those who, who wrote uh, the Canada Health Act, I don't believe. And unfortunately, it, it essentially hasn't had maintenance. Over the last 40 years, we've left this law kind of, as, as Colleen said, it's been in doing yeoman's work for us has been actually, you know, uh, protecting uh, access to care uh, so that it would be in fact based on need and not based on ability to pay and has largely been successful in doing that until recently. Uh, but it hasn't actually gone on to say, and there should be publicly funded systems with primary care teams to the point that every Canadian can be guaranteed access to a primary care team. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think the idea of modifying the act strikes fear in the hearts of a lot of people. Like if we tinker with this thing and open it up, it will just, the enemy will, you know, be rampant and the thing will collapse. So, and that's so, what's come up on the Q and A actually, I would just remind people, please do send in your questions to us on the Q and A and we'll try and get to them. So Bill Toll wants to know what would a Canada health act 2.0 look like? What would it take to amend it? And uh, Ivan, Stephen, in light of what is happening in terms of privatization, especially in Ontario and in Quebec, where I am, where it is really, I mean, it's so far gone that one wonders if it could ever be turned back. Shouldn't the Canada Health Act be rewritten to prevent it and perhaps find ways to, in quotes, innovate, which is a word a lot of us get nervous about when we see it, within the public system, keeping healthcare affordable and accessible? So there's two good questions right there. So what would a new act look like? What could be done about privatization in terms of rewriting the act? Colleen? Okay, so uh, um, lovely, lovely questions. I'll, I'll take the one about rewriting the act. Um, and I agree completely with Jane that one um, foundational measure would be to require provinces to ensure or have every citizen have access to a primary primary health care, hopefully a deem, um, and that that be part of reasonable access. So what the Act currently has, is, as I said before, is nothing substantive about what reasonable access means. It assumes that if you pay physicians reasonable compensation, so it says that, that the plans have to pay physicians reasonable compensation, it assumes that then there will be enough supply. And it assumes a fee-for-service model, essentially. So all of those things we know aren't working for us. So one way to amend the Act would be to say reasonable access means that every a uh, Canadian has to have access to a primary health care team. If you are nervous, and, and I understand that nervousness about, it's kind of a question of who is opening up the Canada Health Act and for what reason. But if you're opening it up with good intent, that you truly want to ensure reasonable access, then this is one of the things that you would do. And I myself would change the Act so that the Fed's federal government would require each and every province to have a very open and transparent method publicly reporting on what reasonable access actually means for their province around primary care, around access to specialty care and wait times for specialty care, ER times, these sorts of things. Every province should tell their publics what it is that they will do. And if they don't, my view is the federal government should not give them money. <laughs> and I think of... I'm going to jump in. Dr. Philpot, you were pretty good at that when you were health minister, withholding the money. <laughs> I, I think I was the first person in um, about 30 years that had actually uh, 
exercised a significant uh, hold back on the transfer based on violations of the uh, of the act. Anyway, I um to to go back to your question uh, from uh, and add on to what Colleen has said, and Colleen and I have debated this a little bit. You know, would you actually re would you open the Canada Health Act and as as she suggests, define some of the terms a bit more clearly, set the standards um, to uh, make more rigorous accountability. Or, you know, I propose in the book what I call a sister act, you know, with a shout out to Whoopi Goldberg for the, the sister <laughs> act. Um, but, you know, I I think I I have suggested, and maybe in part due to the fears that you're you're uh, alluding to, and that people sort of say, don't don't touch what's not completely broken. Um, but also because I think primary care is so essential to trying to fix our system and actually to protect us to the point of your second question or to protect us from uh, those who think that the only solution is to increasingly commercialize access to care. Um, the only way we're going to be able to, to try to hold this publicly funded system together is by uh, ensuring universal access to primary care. And so I propose a Canada Primary Care Act that will establish that right to primary care, that will establish what the standards are, what Canadians can expect. Uh, and if it's not uh, delivered, who will be held to account for that and by what means? So um, I think that you can achieve the same thing either way, but the uh, the reality is it is time to modernize our Medicare legislation in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we won't talk about the current political landscape as it's shaping up because nothing is a done deal in politics, but uh, yeah. Okay. So I'll just move down the question list and I'll throw in a few more questions from me too. Um, Joanna Plater says access to primary health care goes well beyond having a family doctor as mentioned earlier, actually. Uh, as per the stats quoted, those are there. Are, those are the aspects of the system that have not been addressed. And, and in other uh, webinars, we have talked about the importance of uh, nurse yes. practitioners and other facilities that could be organized that aren't part of the hospital model to deliver primary care. So it, this person is saying we need to change the definition and working model. So perhaps you could address that. And then somebody named anonymous attendee uh is asking should a doctor charge a fee if you're asking them to renew a prescription sent in by your pharmacist something as basic as that is sometimes where the system completely craps out on on people like my daughter who has a just yep. today um an antibiotic resistant form of strep could not get her medication in a timely fashion and i'm starting to freak as her mother so i mean this kind of you know so I wonder, uh, would you like to jump in on one or the other of those two things, Colleen, and then maybe you can jump in, Jane? Uh, well, on the on the primary health care front, this is much more Jane's expertise, obviously. And I think ideally, yes, you will have access to a family health care team. But on this score, you know, it's what what you need to do at the Canada Health Act level is achieve some very high level objectives. And the sort of organizational side of things, I think starts to, this is really provincial jurisdiction. So the federal government should be saying, look, you should have access, reasonable access to primary health care. You decide how that's gonna be. I don't think that, you know, stipulating in too much detail what that uh, actually should be organized like is necessarily the role of the federal government. But having that access, and as Jane um, puts it, and I love this analogy of, you know, just as you move around your kid from school to school, they always have access to a school um, the same with, with the same with access to primary care. And I think, you know, in some places it may not be possible to have a team um, even if you wanted it, um, but, you know, depending on the location and circumstances, some sense of reasonable access. The trick with this is that as with the Canada Health Act, the parts of the Canada Health Act that are not mandatory, like reasonable access, the federal government does not have to enforce the requirement for reasonable access and it doesn't. So it only has to enforce the requirements that prohibit extra billing and user charges and Jane and others in that role 
have enforced that requirement from time to time, but not the requirement on reasonable access. So if we are making a sister act of primary care, it has to have teeth, right? Mm -hmm. It has to have, you know, if X percent of your population isn't actually getting access to primary care, then you want the sister act to say the federal government must withhold funding or some proportion of funding, um, you know, and it's got to be some reasonable basis, obviously, because, you know, it's not going to be possible for it to be perfect or 100% of the people all the time and everywhere, but as best as is, you know, some sort of reasonable marker. But this is the problem, the enforcement piece between the federal and the provincial governments. So that's why I'm kind of arguing you want to try to write either rewrite the Canada Health Act or the Sister Act. So like Odysseus, you have the provincial and federal governments kind of tying themselves to the mask. Mast, not the mask. That was that was that was that COVID. During the pandemic. Uh, uh, we're uh, we're on uh, we're in so tying yourself to the mass you know these are things that we will do for you right Damn and you know. and then you are transparently publicly accountable for those things so that you know you can't dictate in deep detail things in this kind of arrangement between federal and provincial governments it's never going to work so that's an answer to the first question from Bill Toll what would the CHA 2.0 look like. I wonder what did what did did you want to add something, Jane? Uh, yes. Well, I mean, Colleen's taken us in a few different uh, paths. So jump, no, it's okay. I tried to decide where I want to jump in, um, and I would agree with you that I, I mean, surely we've learned some things in 40 years about what has and hasn't worked with the Canada Health Act. And you know, Colleen and I are are both. I think fans of the act, but recognize it wasn't perfect. And there are things we would do differently. And I agree, establishing some standards and minimum specifications for what access means uh, is the kind of thing that works in other countries. And I think that, you know, we would be foolish to not look to other countries who have much more successfully than us enabled close to 100% access to primary care in many European countries, for example, they have done so through federal legislation that has laid down the standards and expectations, as well as uh, the accountability mechanisms uh, to that citizens can use if their um, their rights are not being met. Um, and so I, I think that um, that those are some of the things that I would do differently. I Just to kind of go back to the point that one of your questioners had around the team, I, I often need to remember that when I say primary care or primary health care, I always mean a team-based care. I, I do not consider the term to be synonymous with family doctors. I absolutely include primary care nurse practitioners as a, a an, an essential part of the team. But beyond that, of course, uh, RPNs and, and dietitians and social workers and all of the others that you, that you need to be able to work together. Uh, to Colleen's point, that's probably not what needs to be in the legislation. That's an operationalization uh, issue. That's how we make the argument to those who are non-believers uh, about whether we can afford this because then we can start to talk about the fact that actually we can afford this for a whole bunch of reasons in part because it moves the costs upstream but in part because we're actually shifting the tasks to uh, parts of the healthcare team that are less expensive but um, I, I'm glad that your questioner helped us uh, make sure that we are clear about the fact that that is one of the challenges about the Canada Health Act. It hasn't been explicit about the fact that care uh, in the communities, uh, we need to have publicly funded, publicly insured care for non-physician providers in communities. So having said that, here's a question from an anonymous attendee who, who asks, how do we incentivize more doctors to be paid by salary rather than fee for service? Because I gather yeah. there are doctors who say, I do not want to be an independent contracting, running a business. I just want to be a doctor. And then um, another questioner, I think it's Beverly who wants to know, can provinces use the notwithstanding clause? There's a question for you, Colleen to get around the, the provision of no fee healthcare for essential services. Um, do you want to do that one first, Colleen? You want to go in, Colleen? I mean, we saw uh, the government of Ontario use the notwithstanding clause to try and defeat unions. 
they seem to be able, they seem to be increasingly willing to pull it out of their pocket and use it for pretty much anything. But notwithstanding clause, as if there is used in the context of a of a charter challenge. So right. a charter challenge, you know, that might seek to overturn um, minimum or mandatory prison sentence, for example. So a provincial government might use or say they're going to use a notwithstanding clause to overturn the um, court's judgment on the validity or otherwise. So it doesn't really apply in this situation, right? Because we're talking about a, a federal yeah. and provincial contract, really, um, that is articulated in legislation. So you could see, for example, if there was a, um, a successful, you know, charter challenge to to the Canada Health Act, um, you know, saying it is um, uh, a breach of Canadians' rights to limit their ability to buy private care, for example, you could see um, a provincial government or a, um, using the notwithstanding clause in that circumstance. But, you know, as a, as a, a law dean, none of us are keen on that, whatever the whatever the re whatever the season whatever the reason you know we believe that the charter of rights and freedoms is um incredibly important and that um we shouldn't be using the notwithstanding clause and what about the docs jane how do we so I actually i have good news to report on that one um the reality is that uh, increasingly our graduates are actually quite interested in salaried models so mm -hmm. We have seen a real change of expectations around the conditions of work uh, in young physicians. And part of the reason that we're up against these barriers is that the, the models of care, whether they are fee for service or even capitation models where uh, doctors sign up a large roster of patients who are then technically attached to care, but the doctor doesn't work enough hours nor have a large enough team to be able to service those patients. So people technically are attached to a provider but can't get in to see them. The good news is that when you uh, take surveys of graduating physicians, uh, the majority of them actually would be very interested in being in a salaried model. They would like to have flexible schedules. They would love to have benefits. They would love to have holidays uh, that are scheduled in, in time. And so we are seeing young family physicians vote with their feet and choose to become hospitalists or emergency room physicians rather than being comprehensive generalist physicians, which is what we need so badly. Uh, and so the good news is we can actually create models, essentially, you know, community health center type models of care or models of, of practice groups where doctors are salaried. And one of the things I'm excited about that it's not just the young physicians who like those models. We are hearing from recently retired doctors who have walked away from practices with sometimes thousands of patients because they can't manage the conditions of work. But they say if they could walk into a system where somebody else was doing the administrative support and they could do what they've been trained to do and have become good at doing over decades, uh, that they would willing be willing to come back to work part time. So I, we need to be much more creative. And uh, I think that will allow us to be able to to um, reach our, our goals of universal access. I like the idea of bringing back the retired physicians. I think it's shocking that all that expertise is allowed to exit the system and just disappear onto, I don't know, the golf course or something. I find that really <laughs> terrible to contemplate. Drag, drag them all back. Well, it, just, it just speaks to how unappealing um, comprehensive general practice has become. It's exhausting for for these doctors and they they do decide to say i'm not i'm not doing this anymore you know they mm -hmm. can't get a holiday they can't get a locum um and the fact that they actually leave their practices is a rather shocking and it's unfortunate for society mm -hmm. it's a terrible loss um so could an interpretation letter be used to achieve some of these goals that we were talking about earlier colleen the, the question of the interpretation letter has come up in other webinars as well. So can you tell us what it is and what it could do potentially? Well, I think maybe Jane is the better oh, person. Sorry, I should ask the former minister to, yeah, since, sorry. Since, she <laughs> write, since she's written them. Oh, have you written them? <laughs> I wrote some interpretation letters. Um, wow. In, in uh, 2017, probably. 
Um, mm -hmm. Just clarifying uh, our expectations to provincial ministers around All right. of course gotcha uh, around what uh, what what the their ex their requirements were um i think we're really overdue for a few more interpretation letters and i, I keep hearing that there are interpretation letters being prepared around things like um act, you know uh people who are are bypassing the system by charging for nurse practitioner access is probably the best example um and there should be an interpretation letter coming from the minister um clarifying that that is a, is contrary to the spirit of the Canada Health Act i don't know what's holding them back from doing that because i certainly know for colleagues of mine have advised them uh to to uh to put out that interpretation letter. Could it be used for the kind of things we're talking about? Well, for sure it could be, and it would tweak around the edges of the problem, but it's not enough. We are so, so at risk of our publicly funded system falling apart and, and you know, increasingly people fleeing the system, getting out their credit cards, traveling to other provinces, uh, or other countries to get access to care. Um, I guess other countries we, we have a harder time being able to control, but the traveling across provinces, um, huge amount of, of opting out that's taking place and, and um, uh, an incredible amount of, of user fees actually that are, are being uh, used and, and nobody is actually taking action on that. So this will require more than an interpretation letter to to uh, protect us from going uh, the way of a heavily uh, private pay system. Uh, here's another question about doctors, because I think um, people are angry about the state of the healthcare system and they're scrutinizing the healthcare system with a very critical eye. And I, one of the things that comes up is compensation for medical staff. I uh, not even six months ago watched tens of thousands of healthcare workers march down Park Avenue in Quebec, in Montreal as part of what was called the common front, 80 to 90% of them were women saying, we really don't think we're being properly remunerated and we want you to do something about it. And the nurses have still not signed a deal here in Quebec with the Quebec government. And meanwhile, people look at physicians and they think, well, this is, what's going on? Like the doctors seem to be, anyway, what is a fair, how do you, how do you Determine what a reasonable compensation is for a physician who's trained for upwards of a decade, managing comp increasingly complex cases, older patients. I don't know how, I mean, how do you, uh, what would you say to that? Like people are sort of like, wait a minute, they make too much money, but we need them. Maybe they need more money. We need them to stay in the system. What is a fair way to view that? I guess I'm throwing that at you, Jane, but I'm also looking at you, Colleen. <laughs> Well, I'll take them. I'm hoping Colleen will wander into the hornet's nest first. And then I can... <laughs> well, uh, well, it's difficult, right? Um, you know, um, I think what Jane's uh, and others have tried to illuminate is that it's not just the cash, right? It's it's working conditions. It's a sense of being able to take a vacation that, um, you know, that there's someone to cover your pay patients if you're sick and all of these sorts of things. So just like all of us, it's not just the cold, hard cash. It's actually the conditions of work. So, and I think this is true for the nurses as well. So it manifests itself as a, you know, we're not being paid enough, but I would say for all of the health professions that I see, it's, it's more than just that. It's, um, you know, and I think when we think about relative compensation, that's where we start to, uh, really should ask some questions because I think um, I agree with Jane that the foundations of the healthcare system are primary care. Primary care teams, the practice of primary care is incredibly complex because of the heterogeneity of who and what works walks in the door, right? It's not my sister's an ER doc in, in Australia and she gets a sort of who walks in the door, but the family doctor gets it even more right just uh, and so it's very difficult it's hard it's a really tough um gig to be a family care uh team a family care physician so i you know my view is they need to be paid relatively a lot more to encourage them in but 
it combined with the conditions of work relatively to specialists. So, um, but that's just, you know, how I see it. And, but I think that the, the World Health Organization and many other bodies have emphasized the foundational notion of, of primary care. Without that, there's no sort of way into the system, right? Um, there's no path for you apart from the internet. Uh, so, uh, so that's my thinking on it. And I would very much agree with the, the two points that uh, it's not just money, it's conditions of work. Uh, and that relativity within physician salaries or, or compensation is is a huge issue. And it's one of the reasons why, you know, uh, we're down around 30% of our medical students that choose to become family doctors. And when you ask them what the reasons are, the number one reason is compensation, um, that they would rather just deal with one or two parts of the body and be paid a lot more for that uh, than, than to deal with the entire uh, body uh, and and mind uh, all together and uh, be paid uh, less. So um, so that's a huge issue. I also think though that we have to speak to the, about the rest of the team, and I think you were getting at that and to a certain extent. You know, um, we also struggle to attract uh, nurses, for example, and others into primary care uh, because mm -hmm. and physiotherapists. I mean, you can go down the whole list. You will generally be paid less. Uh, if you practice in community than if you practice in a hospital. And hospitals, of course, have these wonderful um, uh, pension and benefits uh, schemes, which uh, you're often not provided with in the community. So uh, it's it just speaks to the fact that we have not designed our health system. If one, our, our friend Duncan Sinclair would say, we don't have a health system. So I'm always reminded of that. Um, but uh, we have not uh, designed our non-system in a way that it is based on primary care. Mm -hmm. So Bill Toll is uh, back in the queue of questions and he says, what, he's asking, why has no federal health minister ever used the gravity of default provisions of the act? Interesting. Well, you know, I think enforcement of uh, the act in general is, is bound up with the complexities of federal and provincial relationships and the whole history of the act. Um, and Jane is again more expert on this than I am, but you know the original sort of art of the deal was the feds paying fifty fifty, and over time, and that has changed. Um, so less actual cold hard cash, more tax points. But you know nobody really wants to put more taxes on people, so is that that much help? So over time, I think the federal government's sense of itself, uh, with Jane as a strong exception, being able to enforce the act has dwindled and diminished. Um, but again, I go back to the fact that the act itself doesn't articulate clear criteria around reasonable access. So it's a little more difficult to hang your hat on it. You need some sort of interpretation, right? So we are interpreting reasonable access to mean that everybody has to have access to a primary care team. Uh, so you don't have it. Um, now, what, what, what do we do as a federal government? Do we withhold the funding? What level of funding do we withhold? All of that is discretionary. And as I mentioned before, the feds have never withheld on the discretionary basis only on the mandatory basis of extra billing and user charges. So, you know, it's a story of a relationship that's deteriorated, hopefully not heading for a complete divorce, but certainly in need of marital counseling. Is that a good, I don't know if that was good, but there you go. I would so um Bill, that is an excellent question. Uh, and I was always curious about that when I was minister as well. You know, why have we never actually used those default pr provisions? But you know, I think Colleen has really nailed it. It it was hard enough to do uh what we wanted to do to 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 essentially penalize the provinces for um to the extent that we were able to uh, prove extra billing and, and user fees. Um, and there was a lot of fear around doing that. And, you know, it takes a, a, took a lot of time and the whole system had become rusty. Um, you know, there's a fantastic division within 
uh, Health Canada called the Canada Health Act Division or CHAD. And they're quietly working away, trying to, you know, single-handedly, or there's a few of them, but there are not very many of them that are holding up the Canada Health Act. And, you know, I kind of got the impression that we, they were waiting for a minister who would come and help them hold it up. And so when they, they came and talked to me about the fact that um, they didn't have, first of all, great mechanisms for being able to determine where the violations were taking place, because essentially they count on... Um, you know, it being reported by the provinces uh, who weren't all who, who weren't generally reporting, they would literally scour newspapers to look for articles that would um, give them clues as to where the extra billing and and, and user fees were taking place. Um, and then we finally sort of hap happened upon through lots of sort of strategizing about how we could do this um, an agreement uh, to audit a couple of the provinces to be able to to um, uh, find uh, th that they would agree to to launch an audit to be able to determine the extent of of those extra bills and, and user charges but uh, it's it because it hasn't been done much in 40 years the muscle memory within uh, the federal government is is pretty weak on this. Mm. I just also add that another limitation of the act is how things or in essential terms are defined. So, for example, the act protects um, medically necessary hospital services and medically required. So I don't know why they have these two separate definitions, but they're not defined in the Canada Health Act. So that essentially is left then to the provinces largely to determine themselves what is medically necessary and medically required. So, you know, COVID brought many uh, extreme challenges to the healthcare system, but also some extreme innovations, including the pivot to online care um, and virtual care, which was was and is incredible but it also raised this issue that okay is a is a virtual consult is that a medically necessary service or not and that's largely been left to the provinces to decide it is either in or it's not um, as opposed to you know the federal government saying that this is definitively and insist upon that this is a medically required service, even if it's a virtual consult. So, so I think these sort of, again, the sort of weakness or um, fungibility of the definitions in the Canada Health Act is allowing a lot of skirting around the law, um, certainly in contravention of the spirit of the Canada Health Act and the sense that Canadians should have access to important care on the basis of need and not ability to pay. And for me, that would include virtual care. So I think virtual care is fab fabulous, uh, a lot of it, um, and should be part of public health insurance plans. Um, but you know, increasingly we are seeing that it isn't. And then when it's excluded and people are desperate for care, like they're utterly desperate you know, of course, they're going to try to seek it however they can, including virtually. And, you know, I don't, in the current crisis, it's hard to criticize that and hard to imagine actually trying to cut that off, right? Unless and until we actually can provide decent, substantive in-person care or publicly funded virtual care, right? How can we possibly do that? Um, so I think we're in a bit of a really difficult and quite dangerous situation now with the desperation that people are feeling because of the lack of substantive access to important life-saving care. I agree that people are increasingly distressed and upset at what they're being faced with if somebody in their family gets sick. And I, I wondered if you could just comment briefly, like the, the, so the dental care program was put into place. Uh, it, re it relies on a private provider, but people have flocked to the federal dental care program with all of the limitations that it presents. And, and uh, the pharmacare program has reached third reading and is now before the Senate. And again, a very popular, I mean, extremely popular program. And Jane, Dr. Philpott joined us on a webinar where we spoke out in favor of it. It was most appreciated that you did that. Um, 
uh, we're a bit concerned it might bog down with amendments in the, at, at this point, but we're really hoping that it'll come into effect. Like people want the feds to step in because the provinces are failing them so badly. So I wonder how that fits into this discussion about accessibility. Mm. Do you want to go, Jane? Go ahead. Um, well, I see these as the the accessibility and the comprehensiveness piece. You know, are the two, I guess, the weak points of of the Canada Health Act, and they go together. You know, accessibility to hospital services and physician services alone are a very sort of 1960s kind of view of the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And as we've heard from Jane, you know, an integrated family healthcare team is much more than a physician. That's it's both better for the patient from a quality perspective and it's good for the system from a sustainability perspective, because all other things being equal, this will be the most cost effective way to provide primary health care. So um, so the comprehensiveness piece actually is linked to the accessibility piece, but we keep going around and around the merry-go-round, you know, that, well, we can't afford to have publicly funded pharma care, dental care, pick your care, uh, because of the cost. And yet we know all the evidence tells us that actually the sort of splintered public private always costs more than the public healthcare system overall that. We know this, everyone knows this from any look at the evidence. So this is just a very myopic look at public expenditures as opposed to all the money that Canadians have to pay through private health insurance and out of pocket. So again, I think, um, you know, honestly, I would give up, honestly, some physician services in exchange for medicines for diabetics if I had to. Right. If it was a hard call on this, I would do that. So I think we should actually have a Canada Health Act that opens up the coverage. I think, that, again, that there should be a, a transparent, clear process by where provinces have to determine, you know, a just and fair basket of healthcare services, including pharma care, long term care, home care, dental care, physician care, hospital care. Let's just discuss this rationally and use the evidence and decide, you know, this is the basket of services that will be covered for everybody. And, you know, we'll review it next year. This is how social health insurers and so on work in Europe. They consider the basket of services um, annually and biannually, and they put things in and out and change it around to reflect new technologies and resources and evidence and move it around and evolve it because, you know, what we got in the 1960s or even the 1980s or even the early 2000s is not what we need today and it won't be what we need in 20 years or 30 years. So if you're having foundational legislation that's protecting Canadians and giving them, you know, de facto rights to healthcare, you want them to be meaningful over time and space, right? You want it to cover the drugs that your daughter needs today. Um, and perhaps some of the older things that we used to cover may not make the cut if we actually have to make hard choices. And I, you know, I would just echo that uh, I think most of your viewers are familiar with the fact that the the founders of Medicare always intended it to be more than just doctor care and hospital care, um, and so we're we're playing, you know, decades worth of catch up, not just forty years, but sixty years worth of catch up of of sort of building that proper publicly funded system that that was initially imagined, um, and so it. it gets a bit hard to choose sort of, you know, when the gaps are so big in terms of what's publicly funded, where would you go first? Uh, I agree very much with Colleen that, you know, accessibility and comprehensiveness and universality, I find those three principles actually all sort of tangled in together. It's a little bit hard to, to sort of tease them out separately. Um, but I think that uh, clearly comprehensiveness is, is as, as much of a gap as, as access is. Uh, and uh, you're quite right that people are thrilled with expanded access to uh, publicly insured services, which is great. Um, I I would like to simply raise the alarm that that uh, 
I think our, our biggest gaps are going to increasingly be in the space of primary care. Um, and until we get that part right and include that clearly and properly and define that expectation that Canadians should have within our federal legislation to be operationalized by the provinces, uh, we will continue to go down a dangerous path. Earlier in the webinar, Dr. Philpott, you referred to use the term commercialization, I think, of care. You didn't say privatization or profitization. And I, I think there was a big demonstration in Toronto last week. It was a Thursday, I believe, a big demo at uh, Queen's Park, started at City Hall against privatization of healthcare, the closure of ERs in Ontario. We're going to see a whole bunch of them close over the next little while for lack of money, apparently. Uh, and I wonder, the Canadian Medical Association held a series of town halls across the country about the balance, they said, between public and private care. And it left a lot of us thinking, wait a second, what is the CMA doing here exactly? I wonder how, how you view this, the increasingly bold incursion into the debate of this idea of profitization and for-profit care. Here in Quebec, you see ads on the sides of buses for private clinics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, $5,000 a year and you're in. That's it. Yeah. Problem solved. So I wonder how you how you would uh, tackle that. Well, I think this is where um, you know people are going to these solutions because we are not seeing the political leadership in just about any order of government. There may be a couple of exceptions of a couple of provinces that are actually, I think, trying to to do better to fix this. But we're not seeing the federal leadership, and in most provinces, we're not seeing the political leadership on health. Um, and Canadians are desperate, as Colleen has already said, and so they feel horrible about um, uh, accessing options through private pay because they they, you know, even for those who can pay, they recognize that that you know queue jumping is not in the best interests of of society. Um, but, uh, and that is why we need to, uh, ensure that we actually fix systems in proper ways. And I'm stunned at the, um, inability to convince governments that we are going down a dangerous path. They, we don't need to experiment with what will happen if we, uh, essentially commercial. I like to use the word commercialized because I think that's what it is. And that, that includes both private pay, but it, it includes uh, more than that. Uh, and, uh, you know, we know that the countries that get the best health outcomes and the lowest costs pay have a much more, a much higher percentage of their total health care spend is a public spend. Um, and uh, that that we also know that they've they've got that universal access to primary care. So um, the solution will never be um, siphoning off public human, uh, the human resources, which are limited um, and having people work in private pay systems uh, because there's there will always be others who are left behind and ultimately we will all pay for that. I think we're already paying for it. We are. I see it in my neighborhood with people who, they are waiting for PharmaCare. My neighbor who has type two diabetes, who pays $400 a month yeah, because he's not covered yeah. by anything. And he's increasingly ill now. I'm watching it happen. It's, it's excruciating to mm -hmm. see. And I'm sure he feels ill all the time. Anyway, I wondered if you wanted to add something to that, Colleen. I think we're coming up to the end of our time, which, which is terrible because we've had 48 questions. And oh. we have almost 90 people on the call. Uh, so, but we can't solve it all tonight and we might have to have both of you back or do some, I don't know, reprise of the Canada Health Act and some of these issues because you're such engaging and wonderful speakers. It's so lovely to have you both here. Anyway, sorry, go ahead, Colleen. Yeah, I, I well, I, I find this a tough one. Um, the private, you know, I, I don't think, there is no, evidence to support, you know, private pay. Um, but there's always a limit to a public health care system. You know, we have to sort of draw the line somewhere and we put things in and out. Um, you know, we've kind of drawn arbitrary lines in Canada where lots of prescription drugs and 
you know, community services and physiotherapy and dentistry and long-term care and home care, that, you know, they're all kind of arbitrarily drawn. So we have more private pay there and private commercial provision as well, ironically, and some for some very vulnerable folks in long-term care. So we do draw lines and lines will be drawn around a public health care system. So I, I do think that we need to have clear, transparent processes for deciding what services are publicly funded. So I've, I find, though, that the conversation that is often launched is kind of code for really what we're talking about is two-tier healthcare, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's yeah. not actually a real honestly meant you know, we really need to figure out an evidence-based mechanism for deciding the core of what is public Medicare. You know, if it, if it was that, sign me up. But if it is like, we just want to sort of wriggle around with what we've got so we can earn some more money on the side. Like, I'm not really that excited about that. But if it is actually, you know, we can get you know, we can get uh, diabetic medicines covered. We can get basic primary care covered, you know, we have standards around how long anyone's going to wait in an ER, you know, that's articulated. And there will always be a space for private, you know, pure private healthcare, right? We, we will. And maybe we might draw that a little more in around some of the physician services so that we can fund other essential care. Right. I think that's a conversation we have to have, but that's different from two-tier healthcare. So I, what irritates me a lot is when people go country shopping and they're like, like, look, look at France or look at Germany or look at the Netherlands. You know, we should have that because they have private two-tier healthcare. But when you really look at them, they're actually really, really different. So in Germany, for example, if you're in the top sort of 10%, wealthy folks yes you can have private health insurance but guess what you have to have it from nose to tail for absolutely everything so it's not two tier in the sense of you know i get to jump the queue for a hip operation or whatever i actually have to take it the whole thing and i the germans have sort of put in restrictions so you can't just kind of waft back to the public system when you find that it's a little getting overpriced and maybe, you know, more and more expensive as you get older and have lots of conditions. So, so I think there is a, you know, we need to have um, a lot more understanding of the economics of healthcare and how private insurance actually works in different jurisdictions, because we often make terrible assumptions about how it really works. And every country has a role you know, limits on the public health care system and a role for private. Um, but it's how to sort that out in a way that makes sure, you know, that that at its core, we have public Medicare that's really working for Canadians. Heath Lowe has uh, put in a comment kind of question as well. How can all these preceding excellent ideas be taken to the public to gain understanding, support and political traction? Well, I Jane. think what... what one of them is to write an excellent book that Jane Philpot just did. Um, and I would be so bold as to suggest that it involves being active in a group like the Canadian Health Coalition or your provincial health coalition. There are some very active, excellent health coalitions in the provinces and territories across the country with room for everybody to be active, be active in your union. There are numbers of forums that you can use because, I mean, Tommy Douglas was voted the most, you know, I forget what the title was, greatest Canadian. Mm -hmm. And I think he probably still would be, although some people have forgotten who he is. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think healthcare is one of the things that defines the country. I, I really do believe that. I, and I, my, my kids who are quite, you know, in their twenties, they say that they feel very strongly about the healthcare system. One of them is working in an ER right now doing a stash as part of her degree in nursing. So I, I don't know. What would you suggest in closing to those people who didn't get their questions addressed and who are we've just sort of run up against the clock now? But what would you say to people, Jane? You've written this book. You've led an exemplary public. Uh, you are a public intellectual in the best sense of the word. Well, both of you are. 
what well, would you suggest to those people? Are like, brands. That's too scary of a category for me. <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, it's very Canadian to be, you know, modest about your achievements. But, I mean, what one, would you say to people? Well, one thing I am happy about with the book is that I feel like um, I, one of my goals was to be able to write about health policy in a way that you didn't have to be a health policy expert to understand. And I, I hope I've come close to achieving that because I think, you know, once Canadians, people are, are worried about the future of healthcare in this country and there's some mythology around the fact that there's no solution and that this is unavoidable. It's all going to fall apart. And, you know, there's, there's nothing that can be done about it. And, and that's simply not the case. And so I hope that as people read the book, that they will uh, get, uh, faith in the fact that it actually there are systems that work there are countries that have done better than we have and we need to use some of those lessons and apply them in Canada so yeah. uh, you know, I hope that as people read that that they will share it with their members of uh, legislation le legislative assemblies or, or provincial parliaments or, or federal parliaments um, mm -hmm. to, to put you know healthcare changes when there's a a, a a surge of public will that drives political will. And that's what we really need on this. Um, and then mm -hmm. my final thought will just be that I think we should all be advocating that Monique Bejan should be right up there with Tommy Douglas as, as one of our greatest Canadians. So let's put in a little equal time for her um, on the occasion of the 40th anniversary. Mm -hmm. Here, here. And maybe we should found the Canadian Healthcare Party. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Just a thought, actually, I, I'm cribbing that directly from my colleague, Steve Staples, who suggested that that's maybe what we need. I don't know, Colleen, do you want to have the last word, a word of encouragement and to hearten the troops? Well, uh, I, I am always astounded by how reticent Canadians are to demand the health care that they deserve. Hmm. We, pay, we pay a good portion uh, towards health care. We deserve so much more than what we are getting. And I actually just don't understand why Canadians aren't kicking the doors in of their provincial and federal governments to get their acts together and give us a decent, well-functioning healthcare system. Uh, we deserve it. We pay for it. And as Jane said, there's absolutely no reason under the sun why it can't be done. It is perfectly feasible and cost is just an illusion here this is a matter of organization and governance and all of those good things that sound boring but I just you know I just what needs to happen so so I would kick the door in I would also think you know about being a lawyer I can't help but think that we really need some constitutional challenges that are about a right to actually public health care, timely, accessible health care for Canadians. That's never happened. Um, yeah. And it's probably past time that someone started to bring those cases because they are surely, surely people who are um, who are in very tragic circumstances because of the state of our health care system right now. Oh, interesting. I hear I hear another webinar series, either at Queen's, done out of Queen's or done by us. It's been really very, I mean, really lovely to have both of you on the line with us. And I want to thank you both very much for joining us. And I'd like to thank all of the wonderful people who are tuned in. And we're going to put this webinar up on uh, our YouTube channel, because apparently we have one. And oh. um, I think we'll probably continue to do similar webinars, hopefully again with Colleen Fuller and Jane Philpott, really exemplary. I, I really do think you are wonderful public intellectuals. So, you know, just <laughs> you're going to have to walk out of here with that on your over your heads. And thanks again to Steve Staples for managing the tech. And uh, don't forget to join us to hear Greg Marshall on uh, public administration next week. And if you can, it's not too late to sign up for the research symposium on June 20th. Great. So thanks once again. Everybody take care of each other. And uh, We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much. Lovely Thanks to be on the panel with you, Jane. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.